Hello and welcome back to Cinematic Universe, everyone. My name is Ernesto Martinez. Joining me, as always, is Catherine Cook. How are you, Cat? Good. It feels like forever since the last movie I reviewed, and that was just Kubo and the Two Strings and Suicide Squad. It's amazing how much of a gap makes it feel like an eternity. So I had two movies to watch this weekend. One of them I skipped out because I didn't feel it was that important for me to watch which was Storks. I still want to see it, but I'm not that pressed on to watch it. And then the other one, which was the priority, Antoine Fuqua and Denzel Washington's latest, a remake of a classic, of another classic, The Magnificent Seven, which originally was a remake of the Japanese movie Seven Samurai, starring Denzel Washington as Chisholm, Chris Pratt as Josh Faraday, Ethan Hawke as Goodnight Rubicho. I believe that's how you pronounce his last name. If I did, didn't did pronounce it correctly, I do apologize for any purists out there. We have Vincent D'Onofrio as Jack Horn. We have Byung Han Lee as Billy Rocks. We have Manuel Garcia Rolfo as Vasquez. Martin Seismeyer as Red Harvest. We have breakout star Haley Bennett as Emma Cullen. Peter Skarsgård as our main villain, Bartholomew Bogue. Luke Grimes as Teddy Q. Matt Bomer in the cameo of the century, Matthew Cullen. And a few other actors out there who you might recognize as in in name or by face. Although I did recognize Cam Giganda with a bitchin' beard playing as McCann. So, Catherine, Magnificent Seven. What can you tell us about the movie? And did you like this new version? I love this new version. Uh, definitely better than its predecessor from uh, the 60s. The original Western was, uh, you know, like a lot of movies back then, it was slower paced and there weren't, you know, the characters in the original didn't seem to have any idiosyncrasies about them. It's like they caught, cast a bunch of big name stars and figured that, okay, you're going to get, you sell a lot of tickets, but they didn't really do much with them. And it was kind of a uh, kind of boring. You're kind of moving around, and it was really slow. And I didn't care for it. This movie, however, was very fun, decently paced, had a lot of humor in it. Every character had their own shtick, something to bring to the table. Leading them, of course, Denzel Washington had some pretty big shoes to fill. And Yul Brynner, who was probably the best thing of that original uh, other Western version of the film, and of course Takashi Shimura from the very original uh, Seven Samurai from 1954. And Denzel is perfect. He totally just, he, he kicks ass in this movie. Denzel <laughs> always kicks ass. He does. And he does so believably. I like that they didn't have the, the movie get, or have the character get, like, you know, hung down by, you know, 1879. Maybe there would be a bunch of racists in the movie making a big distraction over the fact that, oh, this is a black guy and he's a bounty hunter and blah, blah, blah. And I'm glad they didn't go down that route. It's like, we kind of just saw that in Django Unchained. I want to see a different type of, you know, you want to mm-hmm. see a different type of, you know, Bounty Hunter type movie type of thing. Uh, Chris Pratt, very fun. Magician, I like that. He's very funny. He brings his brand of humor to the table. I like that. Uh, Ethan Hawke was probably a big surprise, uh, mostly because he hasn't really done anything in a long time. And he's kind of portrayed as if he's this kind of expert, and it's like, you know, the real cliche character, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, blah, blah, blah. It's like, eh, whatever. Billy Rocks, I loved him. Uh that entire character because it's again very unique i didn't buy the idea that he would be following around ethan hawk <laughs> and having to rely on him he seemed to be impressing people fine on his own nobody seemed to be giving him a hard time as was his explanation that oh he helps me navigate the white man's world I'm like bullshit <laughs> <laughs> i definitely wasn't buying the fact that red harvest would just randomly join them i mean why it's like okay here are all these people. I got this guy to eat. I got this sucker to eat a big chunk of raw meat. So I guess I'll join you. Oh, we're chasing bad people. It's like, oh, you mean like you guys? <laughs> the people who are probably responsible for him. Uh, as he, what did he say? From the elders told me to take a different path. It's like what to kick you out of the tribe? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. And and uh, Jack Horn, another surprise. Yes, he's like uh, I would agree. Uh, with uh, Chris Pratt, he is a, a bear in a human suit. 
uh, not for uh, not a foreign concept for Vincent D'Onofrio, who played an alien in a human suit in Men in Black. <laughs> He was also, yeah, he's a very funny bear of a guy, and I liked him, too. And so, let's see, am I missing anybody else from the seven? I don't think so. But, yeah, there's, like, just right there, the way you talk about it, it's just, they're fun, they're different, they bounce off each other, they don't really relate. Oh, yeah, and then, of course, the Mexican, forgettable. I didn't I didn't buy his reason for joining, either, because he's like, what's my incentive? Oh, well, if you do this for me, then you get maybe a little bit of money, and you'll have one less bounty hunter chasing you, and I'm thinking... Or he could just kill both of you right now, bury your bodies, take the money and run, and nobody will ever know. Yeah, his, his <laughs> inclusion. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. He was just thrown in there. Yeah, I wasn't buying that. I thought they could have come up with something a bit more creative, even if it was going to be a joke. Because, I mean, why not? Well, uh, and he was a joke. I mean, er, to this day, the most memorable quote, at least one of the most memorable quote of this movie is, Oh, great, we got a Mexican. Yeah. And then, with the... Also in the original, uh, something they kind of disregarded from the last movie, the last two incarnations of the movie, is the idea that the seventh samurai was somebody, and the seventh member of the group in the last two movies was somebody who wasn't with them. There were like there were six in the beginning. They all signed up kind of together. They decided they're going to head off and. In the Seventh Samurai, they didn't want to pick the seventh guy because he wasn't a real samurai. He was, of course, played by Toshiro Mifune, who was playing a literally batshit crazy character who was bouncing off the walls. And when there's a when they're on their way to the village to go help the people, they every once in the, he comes like becomes like a joke. They're like, "Hey, what happened to that guy who was following us?" And all of a sudden, you see him <laughs> jumping through the trees like Tarzan, screaming nonsense at the top of his lungs, and everybody just starts laughing because it's like, "What the hell's up with this guy?" <laughs> and uh, Whereas in the the original Magnificent Seven from the '60s, it was a I can't remember the actor's name, but it was some kid, some rookie who they kind of wanted him to join, like kind of like a, a dick measuring contest between who was going to be the guy to turn this guy into a this kid into a really great shooter. But they didn't have that in this movie, and I was fine with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they did do in this movie, which I thought was really excellent, which neither of the previous incarnations of Seven Samurai did, was that they had a really kick-ass, brutal opening where they make the villain like a really evil son of a bitch. Oh, yeah. You can always Plus, count yeah. on Peter Skarsgård to be a son of a bitch. I mean, yeah, yeah, you can, especially since he's like kind of like a little bitch. The only time he's mildly intimidating or seemingly, okay, this guy's going to be a good villain, is when he goes into the church and he gives that little speech with put the kid putting his hand in the jar, I'm like, oh, God, that's so good. But then uh, he kind of does turn out to be a little bitch. He just sits back and lets everybody else do all the work, uh, yeah. which is a bit disappointing. But uh, at the same time, he's, you know, that they play that entire prologue out before giving you the title. It's like, okay, this is going to go up to it. Here we go. Because in the original Seven Samurai, they don't really... I can't. I don't even. It's been a while since I've seen it. I don't even think they had. A, I think it just began with the villagers coming into the, uh, into town trying to recruit the samurai. Then because there was no central bandit character in that, they never. None of the bandits even had speaking roles. I don't think they were just like these roaming marauders, and kind of like with the, uh, the other western version, Eli Wallach only had like two scenes, barely anything to say. But this one, you felt there was more of a presence. There was more character. They had more scenes from them. Sure, it's cliche of a lot of other Western movies, but at least they put a face to it this time. Uh, And, of course, the Indian fight. I love that. I actually called it. I knew exactly what the guy was going to say right before he said it. He's going to say, you're a disgrace. And, of course, he says that. I admit I wanted the fight to last longer. I thought it would have been cool. But, yeah, okay, Indian fight. I like that. I also thought the fight was going to last longer, particularly when you see... That Indian character, which I don't, I don't think they ever voiced his name, and if they did, I don't remember it. But, he's, um, he. They didn't give him a name, but he's from the Denali tribe. Okay, well, the Denali dude, when he threw throws that axe against the running woman, I'm like, oh shit, this guy means business. Yeah. <laughs> and it was kind of disappointing when his fight with Red Harvest didn't go as intense as I wanted it to be. But it was still satisfying, nevertheless. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I had fun with this movie, for the most part. One negative that I do have with Antoine Fuqua, and maybe it's him, or maybe it's the editors that he's stuck with, or maybe it's the studio, but 
at least in the last few movies that I've seen from him, and, and I, mo more recently, um, The Equalizer, there are some things that you need to cut out of your movie. There are, and, and sometimes, you know how when you're looking at pacing, sometimes you can feel the pacing of a movie, and it, and your feelings towards it will depend whether you're going to like it or hate it or just, you know, ugh. Kind of like when they cast a movie with people and you look at them and you're like, I don't really know. Yeah, something like that. So I'm watching this movie and for the most part, I'm like, this was actually very fun. It was very fun movie. I would recommend it. But I would also like to take it back to the cutting board and cut some more stuff out. There are certain scenes that I felt like were, and this is just me nitpicking at this point, there were some scenes that I felt like, okay, this is like two minutes too long, this scene doesn't need to be there, that five seconds that you threw in there, why do you have those five seconds in there, what point do those five seconds have that you needed to throw in there and stuff like that. Something that I've noticed with Antoine Fuqua is that there are something that he just leaves in there that I'm just like, you could have easily shaved that off and nothing changes. But that's just an observation that I've had and... You know, it doesn't really detriment the movie for me. I will point out another thing that I kind of laughed at. When Chisholm meets Red Harvest for the first time. And he's trying to do that, uh, let's call it a meat pack, if you will. <laughs> okay, I've never had to carve meat from an animal ever in my life. But I don't think meat is looks like that, or perfectly symmetrical as the piece that he had to cut out of that deer i'm like okay that is clearly a prop like you could have made that prop look less i don't know cooked it looked like they cooked it they dipped it in a bajillion amounts of gallon of a1 steak sauce and they gave it to to denzel because that was the only way he was going to bite on it yeah I'm just like, wow, that looks terrible. It's like they grabbed a sponge and they just dripped it. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm like, yeah, this was very fun. I can't recall the original. Last time I saw it was four years ago, maybe five years ago during college. And I had fun watching it. I know that I remember having fun with it, especially when it culminated in that one scene with the Gatlin gun, which was pretty epic when I saw it for the first time. And in this movie, the Gatling gun scene is no less visceral than it was the first time. I mean, they really make it a point to show just how powerful a weapon of its time was. And it still is a powerful weapon to this day. I mean, Terminator 2, anybody? Huh. Um, there is one thing that I kind of appreciate about old westerns versus trying to make a western today. You know... With Westerns back then, you actually got to feel like the actor was on top of a riding horse. Whether they used um, stunt doubles or no, you actually saw the actor riding the horse. You saw him doing all these jumps and stuff like that. Here, you can tell that the actors aren't exactly riding and blazing on a horse, especially near the end with Chris Pratt. You know he's on a set and everything. It's a green screen in the background. Particularly when Denzel's riding in the middle of the town and he gets on the side of the horse. Exactly. Guys between the houses, like, and not not even, so much that, but not just because you know that Denzel's no way that he's actually doing that, but he remains almost stationary. I'm like, no, you're not going to be that stationary. And that you know, you're going to have have to have a firm grip on that thing at the very least. And you're going to be gyrating. You're not. He looked like he was on a conveyor belt. Yeah, I, I mean, it was a classic way of shooting. I mean, you also see those in those uh, Western shows, like in Disney and stuff like that, which I liked. But at the same time, it's just like, yeah, no. I'm sorry, yeah. that is no. But given the fact that this movie had like more of a modern touch to it, with, you know, um, Haley Bennett's character being less of a damsel and more of a, I seek righteousness, but I'll take revenge, which, a great line, by the way. Um, I've seen Haley Bennett's character before, but I guess, but I feel that with um, this movie, um, Hardcore Henry and the upcoming Girl on a Train, she's about to be a breakout star of this year. So kudos to her. I look forward to looking at more movies with her. Uh, Peter Skarsgård, I had a, I had trouble getting a read on this guy. 
On the one hand, I'm like, he pl- he he is a great son of a bitch in this movie, and I loved every second of it. I thought he was going to have a scorpion inside that little container he had to put the kid's hand in for some reason. Because mm-hmm. why else would you want this kid to put his hand inside a, a dirt canister? To scare the hell out of me. I know, I know, but at the same time, it's just like, I was waiting for a tarantula at least, maybe a scorpion, something. You know, it is yeah. the Old West. Even kids are fair play at this point. But, I don't know. I, I, I feel like they like deleted a scene or something. I'm just like, why does he behave so much? Is he sick? Does he have cancer? Is that why he's buying off everything to his greed is taking over to the point where he doesn't give a shit? Yeah. That's another thing about people, whether they give a shit or not, is that um, I didn't think the whole thing with uh, Denzel at the end where he reveals why... You know, he has a beef with them. Why, why the thing at the end was uh, necessary? Because you kind of, like I mentioned with the other characters, where it's not really believable that they go along. I actually accepted the fact that he would go along because he is a legitimate, you know, bounty hunter or peace officer, whatever you want to call him. He seemed to be a good right, uh, moral person, and he seemed to be uh, legitimately impressed that she was going to give up everything for him. And even though you know that there's some little backstory there, when he's like, oh, yeah, Bartholomew, I've heard of the guy. But I wasn't buying that, you know, he's that kind of lackadaisical about it all the way to the very end. And then it's like, really? This is kind of, it was all about her story. Now you're going to make it your story. And which it kind of makes sense that they're going to do something like that because you know that she's going to be the one to kill him. It's just that type of movie. And I'm glad she was the one who killed him. Oh, yeah. And, but then at the same time, they had the conundrum where you have to have Denzel be the one to make the confrontation because he's the big, you know, the hero in the movie or whatever. Yeah. So I thought, okay, they're going to play out some way, but I wanted them to do it a different way rather than, okay, I'm going to reveal this ridiculous this backstory for no other apparent reason than to. Uh, I don't know, I guess to make him more of a vengeful son of a bitch rather than a self-righteous man. <laughs> yeah. But at least it still shows that Denzel Washington is the man. He is charismatic as hell in this movie. And when he needs to be intense, he'll turn up the charm down and be intense as shit. Um, I actually liked Chris Pratt in this one. His humor was actually, you know, very serviceable. It wasn't juvenile. And that's the thing with Chris Pratt these days. These days I worry if his ju- if his humor is actually going to be genuinely awesome or if it's just going to be juvenile. Because if it's going to be juvenile, then I'm already walking out of the theater. Uh, and that's just a preference that I have these days. I l- was not expecting Vincent D'Onofrio's character to be so high-pitched. Because <laughs> you don't see him talking in the trailer, but when he actually starts talking, I'm just like, he tried to take my weapon. And I want to get it back. I'm like, whoa, hello. Where did that high pitch voice come from? <laughs> but it still made him a fun character. Ethan Hawk, you know, Ethan fucking Hawk, why not? Byung Han Lee's character, I could not wrap my head around his casting since day one. And it wasn't until the tail end of the movie being released that it actually hit me. Maybe he's there to honor Seven Samurai. Because, you know, He's doing all he's doing all those things with the swords and everything. I'm just like, yep, he's paying. They're paying homage to Seven Samurai. There we go. In the cheapest way possible. In the cheapest way possible, but still cool all the same. Yeah. Um, but yeah, overall, yeah. it's fun, and that's. I was all surprised it. by the amount of them they killed and the which ones they chose to kill. Yeah, yeah. Among the main characters, yeah. Yeah, I yeah they some of them surprised me. I actually, for some reason, didn't expect Chris Pratt to bite it, but when he did, it wasn't... He I didn't either. That was a shot. I was like, whoa, that was a big... That was a surprise. Yeah, but and, uh, he earned it. He did, and I like how virtually all of them get injured at some point during the fight, so it's like, okay, you're not going to make your predictions, so I'll hold off your bets, because it could be anybody. Yeah, that's what I like, that it could have been anyone, and that's where the movie gets a point from me. I'm like, wow. Denzel could have died in this so, movie. So I admit that I would have wanted Jack Horn to take out the Gatling gun because you know, he's a bear of a man. He needs more of a bear of a competition to take him down rather than, uh, you know, I mean, he just kind of gets hit. Yes, he gets hit with some arrows and it's like, oh, intense, or that it's, oh, tough. But I don't know. I wanted him to do something bigger. Yeah. 
don't know. I just wanted something. They, I wanted him to have a more a more poignant death than just. Uh, I thought, and then again, it kind of does seem a bit poetic because they. What was it there? The, they first meet him and they mentioned that he scalps a lot of Indians. Yeah. <laughs> also, wasn't it completely obvious that edit they did when Jack Horn throws the the tomahawk at the guy who took his gun? Oh, yeah. In a split second, you can tell that they spliced those two scenes together to make it seem like the tomahawk actually flew into it. I'm just like, wow, you guys couldn't have shot that better? Really? Yeah. On a $60 million budget, you couldn't make that look better? <laughs> you had four months to film. That could have looked better. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. Magnificent Seven, the new iteration, is very fun. It's got a great cast. You have Denzel Washington, which you can always depend on Denzel Washington for a fun time at the movies. And if you're into Chris Pratt, then you're going to get Chris freaking Pratt. You're going to get a combination of Chris Pratt from Jurassic World and a slight touch from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Only less juvenile. And Ethan Hawke is fucking Ethan Hawke. Enough, enough said. Visit an off he's <laughs> I don't get the whole Ethan Hawke thing. I mean, I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> I just love Ethan Hawke. Granted, I haven't actually seen him in too much, it seems. Yeah, granted, I've seen a lot of his movies that he's done since the last good one, good role that I liked him in. Like, he's been pretty busy for a while. It's just that most of the movies he's been doing in between, if you're not interested, then you're not going to realize that Ethan Hawke is in it. And if Ethan Hawke yeah. is in it, are you going to care that much about it to invest yourself in something that might not be good? You know, I kind of had a similar feeling when I was uh, watching the trailers for this. To, uh, and uh, for the, I mean, not the trailers for this movie, but when I was in the theater and the trailers, they advertised this new one. And I looked at it and it's like the cast was like, I mean, the story sounds maybe mildly interesting, but no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He did that. He did that one with Selena Gomez where he drives the Mustang. God, that was terrible. You said Selena Gomez is just where you could have stopped. Oh no, I never <laughs> saw it in the movie theaters. It, it was. It I know, was, but I meant, I meant that you could have stopped right there to say to, I know. as a qualifier for how bad it was going to be. Of course, you you lost me at Selena Gomez. There is not enough Ethan Hawke in the world to make that movie great. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I recommend this movie. If I were to rate it, you know, overall, I'd give it a 3.5 out of 5. And around like yeah. a 7 ish to a 10, something like that. I'd give it around a 7 to a 10. It was fun. Uh, very, uh, I mean, it, I mean, yes, it feels a little average. There's some cliches in it and stuff, certainly. And nothing new in terms of how they try and surprise you, but, uh, it was a lot funner than the previous incarnation from, you know, what? I mean, gr granted, if you want to do a remake, I thought when they said Antoine Fuqua that they would have changed the setting or the time period or something. And maybe um, like a neo-Western? Yeah, something kind of like a neo-Western. Because, you know, like even uh, Seven Samurai didn't really... Uh, yes, there were some tropes of the Western in there, but it still felt very different from the... 60, whoever it was, I can't remember, that made the original, the other Western one. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> the Yul Brenner one. <laughs> well, who knows? Give it, like, a, another 30 or 40 years, and you'll probably see the see the next Magnificent Seven either take well, place in downtown we, Detroit. Well, I've seen it in the Star Wars universe, even, in the Clone Wars. They did the Magnificent Seven. Oh, yeah, especially with the Rise of the Bounty Hunters. Yeah, they did that with the... I liked in that how they when they did it they they had it, the uh, leader of the bandits be a guy that they had met a couple times in the series prior, yeah. so I was like, oh shit, it's you again. <laughs> oh, I guess we have to fight you this time. Yeah. <laughs> We're not gonna be friends this time. Oh, okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and that's magnificent. Like, this story has been adapted so many different times that uh, it, it. I mean, it's almost futile to try and criticize it when they do it again compared to the other versions that they've done of it. It's just that this is the third one to be done theatrically. And at least with the name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I would have called it Mag 7. 
Mag I mean, seven. this one certainly felt like there was a hell of a lot more action in it, particularly a lot more gunfighting than in the first Magnificent Seven. Oh, and that, definitely a lot more than Seven Samurai in terms of action. That might end up being the title for the more modern take with in a modern setting, Mag Seven. Yeah, cause I'll, tell, I'll say the one thing about Seven Samurai also that makes it the, is that it had the best climax because it was in the rain. It was a grueling shoot in winter, and uh, oh my god, everybody felt like they were going to die trying to film this thing. And it went on and on for long. It's like a 30-minute siege or something like that. It's a really long siege, and it's raining so incredibly hard that it's practically, you can't see very far in front of your face. And it's causing all these mudslides. It's, it's so, and because it's black and white, it's even more, uh, it's a bit more difficult to really see through the trenches if you will mm-hmm. and it was just really grueling and a lot more hand-to-hand combat like really vicious stuff and uh, that'd be nice to see if, if they ever do another iteration of it but i liked the amount of gunfighting they had in this one mm. albeit i didn't buy how how quickly the pathetic townsfolk in terms of pathetic in terms of how they could shoot anything were suddenly able to you know come through in the end well, and with just a few days. <laughs> oh, that's where plot convenience comes in. Because that's actually another thing the Seven Samurai did pretty well. They they accepted the Samurai accepted the fact they can't turn these guys into warriors in a couple months or however long they had, and so they relied on things like okay, we're gonna get dig trenches, we're gonna put up uh, barriers, we're gonna set little fires and you know, do whatever they can, kind of thing. Use the landscape to our advantage if the rains are gonna come, but it's gonna be mudslides. We're gonna use that to our advantage and that kind of thing, rather than just giving them a bunch of weapons and saying. Here, we're going to have one of those shootout sessions. Oh, you're soldiers now. <laughs> yeah, it kind of reminds me of the Kingdom of Heaven, where these aren't warriors, but damn it, grab those barrels of oil and pour them down. Yep. Well, that's Magnificent Seven, everybody. Directed by Antoine Fuqua, starring the ever-awesome Denzel Washington et al. As always, my name is Ernesto Martinez. Catherine, thank you for joining me on this review. Pleasure. And everybody else, you can find me at Cinematic Universe Ultimate on YouTube. Click that subscribe button, leave a like, comment, and share. And you can also find me at moviepod.com or creatorscode.com under Cinematic Universe. Take your preference. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.